Well, Dan Borvin, great to have you back again. You're you're a regular. I shouldn't even say that. You're you're here all the, the time. The regular guest star. You're the ratio. Yeah. <laughs> it's the <exactly>. wacky neighbor. <laughs> um yeah. How's how's the call going? It's good. Yeah. Christ Reformed Church, yeah. Anaheim, if you're in the Orange County area. Yeah. Come out, give us a visit. You're planning to start your own. We're you're going to do some kind of podcast here too on sermons, right? Plans are in the works. Sermon good. breakdown. Sermon breakdown. Yeah, That'd be good. We'll look for it wherever fine podcasts are available. <laughs> <laughs> Only the finest podcasts will have sermon <laughs> breakdown. <laughs> That's good. Um, well, Moses centered legalism. Uh, we were kind of chuckling <laughs> at the title because we, you know, we hear often critiques of you know Christ centered preaching and Christ-centered antinomianism, all these kind of things. And um, I thought it'd be good to, to discuss this, um, to sort of think through what is the overarching narrative of Scripture? How does that play out um, in terms of, you know, application, how we live the Christian life? That's the sort of thing that often gets critiqued as if a sort of Christ-centered approach lacks um, you know, um, a didactic and applicational approach, you know, an imperative approach to, to helping Christians live the Christian life. And, um, I think it's good, especially as you're thinking about sermons, it, it'll be helpful to actually listen to some sermons and engage some sermons, which I think is a really brilliant idea to, um, to help people think through that, that issue, yeah. you know, listening to a sermon is a skill. Mm -hmm. I was telling somebody the other day, you know, just think of what we ask our people to do, to sit there for 30, 40 minutes, yeah. sometimes longer, to one person talking. Don't play on your phone. Yeah. Don't get up, walk around, whatever. People in our culture do not do this. They do not do this. This is as foreign to our culture <laughs> as can be. So I think we should give our people credit. I know. I know. I feel that same way sometimes. I look at them, I think, on Sundays, I, I, I look out here. And I, I see all God's people walking up to the house and I just, oh, I get emotional. It's like, yeah. you know, here's, here's this day where, you know, you don't pat them on the back. We're thankful for what the Lord has done. But at the same time, you want to encourage them. Here's this day where very, the churches are pretty much empty. People aren't going to church. The numbers of people, I think I'm the only one that drives out of my church on, on, uh, drives out of my neighborhood on Sunday to go to church. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And to see God's people come up and then what you're saying it is, it, you do feel the weight of that as a pastor, like they're going to come and they're going to sit and devote their lives to this message, sitting there listening to it. That's a pretty remarkable thing. It's as countercultural as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. Grab some guy on the street, say, hey, you, will, will you sit here for 40 minutes and listen to one guy talk? Yeah. He would crawl out of his skin. <laughs> our people, people in our culture are not used to that. So we should give our congregations much credit for just the ability to sit and listen <laughs> and come. It's astounding. Even if your mind wanders, okay. I mean, the fact that they just will sit there and listen for that long to one guy talk is yeah. really amazing and credit to the Holy Spirit, of course. But listening to a sermon is a skill mm -hmm. that you have to learn. Yeah. what to look for, how to stay engaged, um, how to hear what the preacher is intending to say, identifying different parts of the sermon, even if the preacher doesn't identify them for you. Right. And now I'm going to have the introduction. Yeah. Here comes the gospel call. <laughs> you know, we, we don't tip, tip it off that, yeah. that obviously. So uh, that, and that can lead to misconceptions, misunderstandings, mm -hmm. because if we don't necessarily placard the application in the sermon, right? here are five points of application mm -hmm. for you to take away today. Yeah. Some people, and I've been accused of this, I'm sure you have, people will accuse us of not preaching application. Right. Well, right. the sermon was shot through with application. Yeah. I just didn't stop and draw attention to it and call it by its name. Right, right. But when I say, let us or we should types of things, uh, that's application. It's application. You're drawing it from the text, uh, things that we can do, the third use of the law, applying the law to our lives as Christians. But some people miss that because we don't necessarily identify it, obviously, as here are five points of application yeah. for you now. Yeah. Receive them. <laughs> I mean, all true preaching explains the text and applies the text. 
but it explains the text as the text is given to us. Right. <laughs> right? Like the text has its own sort of approach. It has its its own, you know, it's either coming to you as an imperative or as an indicative, you know, um, it's coming to you in, according to the genre that it's giving to you, what it's trying to accomplish, historical narrative, and you've got to be disciplined to deliver it on, on the text's terms. Right. And then apply it on those terms. Oftentimes, times what we're hearing is when redemptive historical, and we'll get into this here in a minute, redemptive historical preaching gets you know, critiqued is that it's usually some, you know, I don't want to say this always, but it's, 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 it's some who really want us to take and bring in the political environment into the pulpit so that we are specifically, uh, you know, applying social and political issues to these things. And most of the time, these things are completely divorced from the text. The pastor has right. run roughshod over the text and has decided himself to, to bring in this, this point because he's going to be really bold today. He saw something on the news last night, and he's going to be really bold today to address this topic and show everyone how he's courageous. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's not courageous. You know. Somebody asked me in 2020 when all the riots were happening and everything, all the strife in America, somebody asked me, how I was addressing that from the pulpit. I said, I'm not. I'm preaching through the gospel of Mark. It hasn't come up in the text yeah, of right. Mark. When it does, I'll address it. Right. The text tells you how to preach the it. Text, the text governs us. Yeah. And so we shouldn't force those things into the text or shape a sermon uh, necessarily to address the issues in our culture. Now, of course, there are occasions times of calamity where we might yeah. preach a sermon yeah. specifically uh, addressing things that people are thinking about. You know, the, the reformers did that in the 16th century sure. when the uh, Schmalkaldic war kicked off in the 1540s when the Holy Roman empire marched into Germany and steamrolled over the Protestants. There were calls for times of fasting and praying addressing these issues. So certainly there are extreme circumstances. Of course, we can't address them from the pulpit, but in most cases, yeah, these are extraordinarily rare times to take a break from your Lectio Continua preaching and address specific issues uh, that our people are facing. Most of the time, we're going consecutively through a book of the Bible and you let the text tell you how to preach it, right? how to present the gospel, how to find Christ in the text, and how to apply that text. Now, some of the criticisms of redemptive historical preaching... Maybe we should just define it. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. Go for it. Your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're talking about when we talk... We, we, the, the scripture has an overarching narrative to it, right? And, and this was so helpful for me when I was first learning how this, the scripture sort of shrank for me when I understood that the whole message was intending to show the redemption throughout history, planned, purposed, and accomplished redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the scriptures are all aiming in some way, doesn't mean we artificially find this in the text. I think we should address that. Right. But it's aim. It's kind of like Harold Camping, who saw the, said the floating axe head was Jesus. <laughs> you know, so somehow that's spiritualizing. That's allegorizing. That's origin style. Yeah. And, you know, but what we're saying here, and we recognize that is that is a danger. Yes, we don't know? like that either. No, we don't like that either. But to, to say, how could anyone, if Jesus himself at the resurrection, First sermon he preaches, correcting the air of the disciples and their discouragement was to say, listen, beginning at the Moses and the law and the prophets, he expounded to them in the scriptures all things concerning himself. He's setting a paradigm for us. He's setting, he's telling us, he's he's now showing, because what what is the blinder on the Jewish mind to this day? It's that there's a veil over their hearts that when reading the Old Testament, they don't see Jesus, Right. So Christ is preaching himself from all these texts that in general we would simply take as moral yeah. for us to fulfill. No, Jesus is correct. It'd be and when when Luke 24 says that, he's he's going through 
all the genres there, right? right? The Psalms even to show that they're about Jesus. So anyone who would attack that or anyone who would deny that overarching framework and structure and the intention of preaching is, is undermining the very plan of God to make known his salvation to the people in Jesus Christ. But I've heard it said as a former dispensationalist, as a recovering dispensationalist, <laughs> we need dispensationalist anonymous. I think I should start that. <laughs> Kim Riddlebarger and I could make a mint. Dispensationalism anonymous. I was told from my dispensationalist teachers, they would not deny that this is how Jesus read the Bible with himself at the center. They would not deny that the apostles read the Bible this way, but they would deny that we should read it that way. Point blank, I heard it said, that's okay for them. They can read the Bible that way, but we can't. So we shouldn't do what the Spirit inspired. That's right. Well, I know that, you know, there was a series of lectures at the Master's College, and MacArthur's been on this, and Keith Lemahieu. And Lemahieu did a critique of Christ-centered preaching and it was it was really it was really some of the worst straw man sort of presentation of Christ centered preaching I'd heard, which often happens in this discussion. But I think what they are reacting to is kind of what I said about camping, like yeah. you know this approach of we're shoehorning Jesus into the text, we're shoe we're trying to find Jesus artificially, and then what happens is we've talked about this before. Then what happens is. We start preaching, we preach Jesus, or we preach the law, and we get to the law, and we always say, oh, don't worry about it, you can't do it, here's Jesus. <laughs> and so it's just this artificial, they, they assume this artificial sort of presentation that shoehorns Jesus in at the very end or in some artificial way to basically say, you can't ever live the Christian life, I heard one pastor say, you guys are always on this contrite sort of contrition path you can't do anything right, therefore, you just show Jesus, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> and, it's like, and, and it's like, that is such a poor presentation of redemptive historical preaching as, you know, as it, now, and now it's true, some of the Reformers didn't quite, you know, you listen to some of the Reformers, they didn't quite have that appreciation of it like they should have. Um, and I think that's something we can talk about. Um, they, they intended to make known Christ, don't get me wrong, but I think... There was a real concerted effort after the response. Well, I like your opinion on this. After dispensationalism and after the abuses of Scripture, to to bring back a Christ-centered approach, and it came in with with strength in yeah. in the nineties and two thousands. Right. Yeah, and and as we said, we don't like bad redemptive historical preaching either. Right. There are ways to do this poorly. Right. And we should be critical of those ways, not attacking the man himself, but right. saying that. There are good ways to do this, and there are bad ways to do this. The artificial way, you know, pull Jesus, the rabbit, out of the hat at the end of the sermon. Ta-da! Right. You wondered how I was going to get there. Here it is. Yeah, that's forced. It's not It's not helpful uh, for people. One, one, one of my goals in preaching Christ from all of Scripture is for our congregation to look at the text and see, well, that's obvious. Right. It's not some uh, magic trick that I'm pulling off to get Christ from this passage. Right. I want people to look at the text and be like, well, why are we paying this guy? It's so clear from the text. I didn't need him to hear, to tell me this. Jesus is leaping off the page. Yeah. Yeah. For them. Yeah. Story, take a story of Joseph. Exactly. I mean, he's all over that. Sometimes I, I, when I said reformer, sometimes I think of Calvin, I read him and I think, man, he really missed Christ there, you know, yeah. but it was, re it's really good. It's really good exposition. And, and that's part of the challenge of, of this, you know, redemptive historical model is to be faithful in preaching Christ as he's shown in fulfillment, but as these texts foreshadow him. Right. There's foreshadowing. And to be fair, I will take a forced presentation of Christ and the gospel over no presentation at all. Yeah, right. I've heard many sermons that could have been preached in a synagogue from the yeah. Old Testament. Right. Where Jesus did not show up. He didn't show and up. And all we get is some moral teaching, you should be like this, and it could have been done in a synagogue. Right. That's not Christian preaching. It's not Christian preaching. So I'll take a, an awkward, clumsy presentation of Christ, and it, but at least you get Christ. Yeah. And these guys never criticize Spurgeon. 
for right. saying every road <laughs> will lead me to Christ. You know, he preached that way. He yeah. thought that way. You know, his his preaching was different in that he wasn't as expositional, I think, as our day. In other words, you just, you just grab his sermons, you have one verse, and then he's right. off. You know? it's like, <laughs> so it's a little more topical, um, which, you know, topical preaching can be done well. It's a place for that. It's a place for it. It's our catechism preaching, which is that. But but I guess what I'm, what I, what I, we're looking at Jesus himself and looking at the, the disciples in Acts, you know, what were they doing at Pentecost with the texts, the Old Testament texts that were in front of them? You know, that's, that's, that's normative for us. They're preaching. Um, in other words, they are taking Old Testament texts, are taking, they're taking Joel. Um, they're looking at a variety of, of passages that speak, that speak of Christ and they're preaching Christ from the Old Testament in fulfillment. And that is the power of God to draw people to repentance and faith. They're crying out after a sermon like that, which we would consider as dry and boring today. They're crying out saying, well, if he's the Messiah and he's come, what do we do to be saved? Yeah. Right. Because they're showing him from the Old Testament. Peter has a string. It wouldn't probably match well or be graded well in the seminaries today. He (laughs) strings together a bunch of Old Testament texts and preaches Jesus. Not yeah. very structured, it seems. Yeah, you know, but that's what he does. You know, yeah, yeah. And and one of the benefits of preaching this way is it teaches people how to read the Bible, right? If we can model that through each passage of Scripture, then the congregation can, in their own time, when as they read the Bible, they can look for Christ as well. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the side benefits of preaching this way, and it's one of the skills of listening to a sermon is. That's instructing you how you can read the Bible right? with Christ at the center. He's on every page. He told us this. Why would we not believe him? Yeah. Now, he said this explicitly. Yeah, we you didn't make this tell, up. You want to tell these people, he said this. He <laughs> told us to do this. Yeah. But he said, I, and so you think of the, the, the Emmaus disciples again, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Is that not a model for us? Shouldn't we not be expounding in all the scriptures the thing concerning Jesus? So, um, to sort of categorically mock this or set it aside, I think is a great insult to the resurrected Savior who taught us to do this. That said, you know, I think what we need to remember in the overarching picture is there's two kinds of ministries. Paul addresses this in um, 2 Corinthians 3. Um, So, the ministry of death... This is verse seven. If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory is passing, was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Now, um, and then he goes on, and what does he say in chapter four? He says, he says this, um, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it's God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who's shown in our hearts to give what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, two ministries. There's a legal ministry. That's in the law engraved on stones. And then there's the ministry of the Spirit, which is the ministry of righteousness. What is the Spirit's work? To bear witness to the Son. If the Spirit's work and His ministry is to bear witness to the Son— we better preach Christ. That's yeah. what Paul says. Yeah. So I don't know why people are arguing about that. <laughs> <laughs> I just sealed the deal, didn't I? <laughs> that could be a heading for any social media. <laughs> why are people arguing about this? Yeah. Yeah. And and again, it can be done poorly. Right. And we want to rectify that. We don't want to do this poorly. We want to do it well. And to do it poorly is to avoid preaching the law, which to me seems to be rare. I don't know. I don't hear many people uh, preach full-blown antinomianism. Yeah, I've rarely, I've rarely <clears throat> met a full-blown antinomian. I, have, I've, I think I've met, I've met a few. 
Yeah. But very rare. Somebody come along and says, yeah, the moral law of God doesn't matter anymore. Right. Third use. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've never, it. never heard that. Yeah. So antinomianism is being thrown around today in the most careless, irresponsible way. That's a pretty serious charge. That's a very serious and, charge. You know, um, when we have the Heidelberg and I, you know, and we'll talk about preaching morality here in a second. It is the Heidelberg places, our confessional document places the law in the gratitude section. Yes. To say we're not antinomians because we believe that Jesus should be preached from all scripture, right? right? Yeah. And one one way that this preaching um is not done well is when you preach the whole Bible in one sermon. Often redemptive historical preaching, when it yeah. goes off the rails, it's hard to find the sermon from the particular text the pastor claims he's preaching. Yeah. Right. And you're looking at the text and you're hearing what he says and you're like, you're kind of preaching the whole Bible, man. Mm -hmm. You know, what about this text? What does this mean? So one thing we want to do is to preach a specific passage of scripture, not the whole Bible. Of course, as you said, the whole Bible has this theme, this redemptive theme in Christ from Genesis to Revelation, but we want to preach it as that's unveiled in a particular passage mm -hmm. of scripture, mm -hmm. not just preaching the whole Bible. Because that can be very um, difficult to hear, especially week in and week out. Like, where are we? <laughs> I thought you were doing yeah. Lectio Continua. Yeah. We're going through a book of the Bible, but it seems as if you're just all over the place. Yeah. That's difficult to ask our people to sit under that on a regular basis, have a steady diet of that kind of preaching. Yeah. No, I think that's exactly right. And, um, you know, there has been, we have to admit, very poor redemptive historical preaching in that there have been some who have been afraid because of this to give application. And I think, I don't think that's a widespread problem, but it is a problem. I, I've known, I've known some, so that's why I say, it. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that the thing is, is to say this, let's just take the structure of Ephesians, right? You have the first three chapters that are dealing with the indicative. Everything in those chapters is about what God in Christ has done for you right? It's all about, it's all, it's all indicative. In other words, he's predestined you to glory. He's, he's, he's redeemed you. He's given you a spirit, sealed you. Um, you're saved by grace. He goes through all those beautiful, he's reconciled Jew and Gentile together, made them one. Oh, the depths, I, I pray that you know the love of God, the height with, and all that's indicative in that. I'm going to preach that. When I get to chapter four, I've already done my job in rooting that indicative so that now when he says, therefore, and I get to very practical things, I can preach that because I have rooted. So you're looking at the whole of a man's ministry. Yes. You're not doing what you're saying is saying, listen, I have to do this in every single sermon so that it sounds like the same thing. No, that's, that's just, that's bad. No, we're doing what the text says. We're doing what books tell us to do. But even in that indicative, even in now, therefore, here's how you'd live. We preach those things. We tell people how to live. We tell people what the scriptures say. We um, tell them how to live thankful lives. We tell them to put to death sin. We tell them to keep the moral law of God out of thankfulness. But that's still rooted in you are a new creature in Christ. Yes. You belong to him, body and soul and life and in death. That's not lost in, right. in the law of preaching. What I think happens is, and I'd like you to engage with this, when we talk about sort of Moses-centered legalism is, ah, Dan, you're not doing enough, man. You're not. So, so the ministry turns legal, even at times angry, frustrated, because the level of sanctification is not where the pastor is deemed it should be. Right, right. And yeah, is he looking at, at, at his congregation and thinking of things that he would like to be changed? And so maybe with a heavy hand, he's trying to accelerate the change faster than the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. But even when you said with, with the Ephesians, you know, first three chapters, indicative, last three, imperative. When you preach those first three chapters, you're still going to give imperatives in the sermon, the third use of the law. And also, when you're preaching the last three chapters with the imperatives, you're still going to give the indicative of the gospel. So even if a passage is clearly a gospel passage, or if a passage is clearly a law passage, you're still going to give the law and the gospel in every sermon. Right. And it doesn't have to be artificial. It doesn't have to be forced in a very contrived way. Every sermon we preach the law and the gospel. 
will there be more emphasis on one or the other? Of course, maybe time, but we don't, we don't divvy up our sermons. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I I spent 26 minutes on the gospel and 13 minutes on the law. So that's good. You know, every sermon law and the gospel preach Christ and comfort your people. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, especially in our context, when we talk about Christianity in the negative world, Aaron Wren, uh, Whenever you're hearing this, the Reformed Forum is doing a, a symposium on uh, living in the negative world. Aaron Wren and other guys, Daryl Hart, our friend, is going to be speaking at it. it. Will be valuable to listen to. But as Christians in the negative world in the United States, they're beat down. Mm-hmm. We're losing. Yeah, the culture war. Yeah, we're not winning. It. We're not winning. We're not Charlie Sheen winning. <laughs> yeah. We're losing. Our people are kicked around by this world, and. They can that can lead to despair and hopelessness. So oftentimes, one of the application points of my servant sermons will be take comfort. Mm-hmm. Now that's law, right? Rest in this. That's an imperative, right? But it's it's an imperative cloaked in the gospel. Take comfort that Christ has you mm-hmm. in His hand. Right. You will not fall away, no matter what happens in the world around you. You're safe in Christ. So our application doesn't have to be a sledgehammer on people. Right. You wicked sinner, uh, you must change immediately. Uh, you know, these sorts of caricatures. Mm-hmm. It has to be appropriate to what the text is and to what our congregation needs to hear. We're not preaching to the radio. We're preaching to specific people over whom God has given us charge. Mm-hmm. We are the shepherd of these sheep, not random sheep on random random sheep on random hillsides. So I want to preach to my congregation. If other people can benefit from that, that's wonderful. But my concern is preaching the law and the gospel to my congregation. 